Good evening. Let's turn in God's Word to John 15. We've got a few background scriptures to read tonight. John chapter 15. Gospel according to John chapter 15. John 15, as you know, the Lord in this section of the Word of God is preparing His disciples for His departure. It's often we call the upper room ministry because chapters 13 and 14 take place in an upper room. It seems that 15 and 16 are as they're going out towards the Garden of Gethsemane. And in John 15 and verse 18, the Lord Jesus says to them, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. And then please to chapter 16, verse 1. These things I've spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. And then please over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1, verse 13. Galatians 1 and verse 13. Now let me back up to verse 11, actually. Galatians 1 and verse 11. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. 1 Timothy chapter 1, please. 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy 1. In verse 12, the first epistle to Timothy, chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. And finally, to Acts chapter 9, please. Acts chapter 9. The ninth chapter of Acts. And we'll begin at verse 1. 
Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. Acts 9 verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threatening and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. But by way of a cliffhanger, we will stop our reading there to wait to see what the Lord says to Ananias. Now, the man we've read about, Saul of Tarsus, was a person that could well be described by our Lord's teaching in John 15. That our Lord said that if they've hated me, they will also hate you. And then in chapter 16, how he said that the time would come when the person killing them would think that he did God's service. Now, one could think to ISIS or Al-Qaeda or certain communist regimes in recent history that have the blood of many Christians on their hands. One could think of certain authorities in various countries that we could name today that consider it a sport to harass and persecute and even kill believers. But when the Lord Jesus spoke those words... In John 16, he specifically addressed the Jewish context that he was in. That they would put you out of the synagogue, which if you were excommunicated from the synagogue, if you were put under the ban by the Jews, then no Jew was to have anything to do with you. And as late as the 1600s in Amsterdam, when uh, Baruch Spinoza who later came to be known as Benedict Spinoza, one of the most famous philosophers of the last 500 years, although someone I would firmly and vociferously disagree with in what he believes. But when he started to form heterodox heterodox views regarding God, in other words, when he got off of what Judaism was, the Jews of Amsterdam excommunicated him. And so he befriended Gentiles. All of his friends became Gentiles because Jews didn't want to have anything to do with him. And even today, if a young man or young woman or older person for that matter who is of Jewish extraction confesses faith in Jesus, if they say Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus is the Messiah in Hebrew, they are often by their family thrown out. In fact, it's been known, it's not unusual for observant Jewish families, especially in the Orthodox and Hasidim worlds, to hold a funeral for that son or daughter if they confess Christ. Now, I understand that we have millennia of anti-Semitism, that we have centuries of people doing awful things to the Jews. And it should be noted that sadly, many times, There were things done to Jewish people. There was persecution brought on the Jewish people in the name of Jesus Christ. And that is wrong, of course. Because when you read the Bible, the Lord Jesus is not against the Jewish people. The Lord Jesus is not against Israel. 
Can you hear the Lord Jesus standing outside of Jerusalem in Matthew 23 saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now, let me tell you, when a name is repeated in the Bible, such as it is here in Acts chapter 9, Saul, Saul, or the Lord in Matthew 23, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. That is expressing deep emotion. It calls to mind in 2 Samuel when David was mourning for the death of his son Absalom. Absalom, Absalom. Would to God I had died for thee. O Absalom, my son, cried David. And here the words of the Lord Jesus. Here the depth of his love, the heart of pathos that he had for the city of Jerusalem. When he stood outside that city for the last time before they would take him and put him through a series of sham trials and cast him out of that city to be crucified. He stood outside that city in Matthew 23 and he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee? As a mother hen gathers her chicks, Now think of that image of Psalm 91. You may be familiar with Elizabeth Elliot's biography of her late husband, Jim Elliot, who was killed for the faith in January 1956 in Ecuador. And she called the book she wrote about her husband, The Shadow of the Almighty. And the language is taken from the 91st Psalm, verse 1, that says, He that abides under the shadow of the Almighty, he... Uh, it goes on to talk about how he will be sheltered or find refuge under his wings. The hymn writer has written, Under his wings I am safely abiding. You know that hymn? It speaks about the protection and the security that God gives. That's an image that is used in Scripture to talk about how the Lord wants to gather his people. He wants to shelter his people but there's an old southern gospel song. I'm sure somebody has sung it here. I mean, I don't think there's a one Bill Gates has ever touched that the Spanish Wells Choir hasn't attacked. And if there is, tell Brother Adam, he'll track it down. But you know, there's that song, Sheltered Safe Within the Arms of God. Well, that's a very biblical sentiment, a biblical idea. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus was saying. I don't want all of the harm that's going to come to you. I don't want the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. I don't want the temple to be knocked down so that no stone is left on one another. I don't want them to take you away in the captivity. I don't want what they did to you in the Babylonian captivity or what Assyria did to the ten tribes in the 8th century BC. Or for that matter, what Egypt did to them way back in the Exodus. God says, I've heard the sorrow of my people. God says, Israel is my firstborn. Out of Egypt have I called my son, Hosea would say. And although that's prophetically used in Matthew 2 of the Lord Jesus coming back from from Egypt, originally it was talking about Israel being brought out of Egypt. And God says, I want to protect you. I want to shelter you. And think about through all the centuries that the Jewish people have been scattered and been subjected to persecution the world over. Persecution in my country at the hands of the Ku Klux Klan in some of the communities where I live even. Persecution at the hands of the Nazis in Germany. But it wasn't just the Nazis, was it? There were country after country in the 1930s and 40s that lined up to participate in the Holocaust. And still today, we have people in the Middle East that say we want to obliterate Israel. We want to push the Jewish people into the sea. We want to kill them all. And believe me, the Lord Jesus doesn't sanction. The Lord Jesus doesn't agree with. The Lord Jesus doesn't endorse any act of violence against anyone, much less the slaughter of the people that he calls his people. The people that he chose and gave promises to and covenants to and the oracles of God, what we call the Holy Scriptures, entrusted to that people. And yet, 
as much as God loves Israel, as much as God loves individual Jews, as much as every Jewish person that comes to receive the Lord Jesus Christ by repentance and faith is born again and saved and made part of the body of Christ in this age, just like any Gentile who cries out to Christ is born again and saved. As much as that's true, as much as Romans 9-11 through 11 tells us that God has a plan to restore Israel, that there's prophecies that Isaiah and Micah and Zechariah and the other prophets talked about will all be fulfilled. Nothing left undone. As much as all that is true, we can't ignore the fact that when the Lord Jesus came to earth, the nation by and large rejected him. He came unto his own, says John 1, and his own people received him not. Now that's a serious thing, isn't it? And we could get a little bit smug tonight and we could say, well, uh, wasn't that foolish of them? I mean, here they were. They had millennia of the Lord speaking to them, going all the way back to even before the patriarch Abraham, but certainly since Abraham, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the twelve sons of Jacob, the twelve tribes. And then look at how God dealt with that nation through all of history and how God gave them his word. No wonder the Lord Jesus said to two of his disciples, mind you, in Luke chapter 24, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And going through, he said, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to have entered into his glory. And beginning at Moses and the writings, he went through all the scriptures showing the things concerning himself. And yet when the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth, when the Son of God came to Israel, it was only a small remnant that believed on him. It was only the few that believed on him. It was more common that people that believed on him were cast out of the synagogue, like the man in John 9. You remember him? Born blind. But the Lord Jesus opened his eyes and they threw him out of the synagogue. Well, I said, If you're thrown out of the synagogue, that's it for you. You're not getting a job in the Jewish community. Nobody's going to sell you anything in the Jewish community. You're not going to be able to go to any social gathering with observant Jews. That's it for you. You're rejected by the whole community. But in John 9, the Lord finds that rejected man. The Lord receives that man. The Lord tells him further who he is. Who is the Son of God? He who speaks to you am He, says the Lord Jesus. I I am He. Now, when we think of how the persecution came from the synagogue, came from the Jews, that up till now in the book of Acts, it's been Jewish persecution against the Lord, against the apostles, against the gospel, we might think, well, that's just how it's going to be. I guess the Jews have missed it. And I guess now God is going to turn to the Gentiles and he's going to have to save the Gentiles and that'll be it. He'll just save Gentiles and forget about those promises to the Jews. You know, that's not so at all. In fact, Saul would say, as we read in 1 Timothy chapter 1, the very reason God saved me is as a pattern to those who would afterwards believe. In other words, if you look at anybody in this community, or in any other for that matter, and you say of that person, they are too bad to be saved. A person that steeped in sin, a person that obdurate of heart, a person that rebellious against the Word of God, a person that antagonistic toward the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they can never be saved. And I want to tell you, don't let it cross your mind, dear saint of God. Don't stop praying for the lost. Don't start thinking that there are people that it's just too late for, unless, of course, they've passed into eternity. Then it is too late. But if they're here, if they're living, if they've got a pulse and some kind of mental activity to perceive, the truth of God and the gospel, the Lord can save. And Saul is the example of how far God is willing to go to save somebody. 
Now think of who Saul was. I mean, he'll tell you his credentials in Philippians chapter 3. You know, I was born a Jew. I was circumcised the eighth day. Now, Saul didn't ask for that, of course. He was just a little tiny baby. And he didn't say, oh, Mom, Dad, I think you ought to take me and have me circumcised the way the law commands. No. By him saying I was circumcised the eighth day, he's telling us, I came from God-fearing stock. I came from ancestors that wanted to obey God's word. And so they made sure that I had and the circumcision performed on me when I was eight days old. And what's more, I was of the stock of Israel. Now, even today, in some quarters, Jewish people wring their hands about the Jews that intermarry with Gentiles. And I've heard and read rabbis say, what's going to become of the Jewish people if we don't maintain our distinctiveness? If Jewish boys are marrying Gentile girls and vice versa, you know, uh, Jewish women are marrying Gentile boys and so forth. How do we know the Jews will continue on? What's going to become of us? And yet, you know, for all of the persecutions, for all of the terrible suffering as a nation that they've had, and as a people through history, it is one mark of the truth of God's word and the absolute fidelity of God to his promises. In other words, that God never goes back on a promise. He is the divine promise keeper. He is not a man that he should lie. He is the God who cannot lie, the book of Titus tells us. No, God isn't going to go back on what he's promised Israel. He'll yet again choose Israel. He'll yet again save Judah, Isaiah says. And then Romans 11 tells us, Out of Zion shall go forth a deliverer, and so all Israel shall be saved. In a future day, that remnant of Israel that calls out to the Lord, as Zechariah 12 says, that they look on him whom they pierced. They say, wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. They say in the language of Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And they're going to cry out to him to save them. And in that day, he'll save them. Zechariah 13.1 tells us that there will be a fountain opened for uncleanness. And the Lord will pour on them the spirit of grace and supplications. Now I say again, we can look back and we can kind of look down our nose and say, well, those Jews, they were very foolish, weren't they? I mean, look at all the advantages they had. What advantage then hath the Jew, Paul asks in Romans 3? Much in every way, he says. Firstly, unto them were committed the oracles of God. They had the revelation of God. You know, you're not going to learn who God is without getting into the Bible. They had the Bible. Now, what a blessing that is. Do you know how many men and women have died in the history of the world for the sake of translating the Bible and disseminating the Bible? Do you know there are people in prison today around the world? Their only crime is they had a Bible or they tried to bring Bibles into areas where they are banned. I had a friend who was working at one time in the 90s in a Middle Eastern country that is an ally of the United States. And although he was working there as a civilian, he was uh, uh, teaching English as a second language, he was not even allowed to bring his personal Bible into the country. They said, no Bibles. So my friend spent a lot of time memorizing the scripture before he went, and he photocopied large sections of the Bible and hid them in other things in his luggage. That's what he had to do. And that was 1995 or so. I mean, amazing. The war on the Bible. Well, think of Israel. Think of how they've had the Bible for all those centuries. And they preserved it. Look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. They have the shrine of the book in Israel. Some of you have been there. And you've seen those scrolls that the archaeologists found in 1947. And you've observed the scrupulous detail with which they copied the scripture and they've handed it down to us. I say thank God for the Jewish scribes. Thank God they preserved it. Thank God for the monks in this and that monastery all throughout the Middle Ages that copied the scripture. 
thank God for Gutenberg. He was trying to make a buck at the printing press. But the Bible got disseminated far and wide by him. Thank God for those who've printed the Bible for us, who've translated the Bible, who've passed out the Bible. And to us, the Bible is so common, maybe we take it for granted. I hope we don't. Well, think of how we can be much like those Jews, you know. Because Paul would say, I was of the stock of Israel. We weren't intermarried with anybody. I was a pure-blood Jew. (laughs) And some of you could say, well, I've been a Christian. I'm now the third or fourth or fifth generation in my family that has known the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you might be able to say, I'm the third or fourth or fifth generation that's fellowshiped in the local assembly that meets in this building. That's a great heritage, isn't it? It's a great privilege. But privilege brings responsibility. And the dangerous thing is, having the Word doesn't mean that we believe the Word. See, that was the problem that happened with Saul. Because he was not only of the stock of Israel, he would say a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Now, in the intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew, I mentioned this in an earlier message, Alexander the Great conquered such large amounts of territory in the ancient world that Greek got spread all over the world. And much like everybody wants to learn English today, all around the world, at least English numbers, five dollar, five dollar, that kind of thing, you know, Everybody wants to learn it for business and for commerce and even for diplomacy and science. It's kind of the new Latin, one of my Spanish friends told me. Even how people want to learn English today, that's how Greek was in the ancient world. And so a lot of Jewish families that wanted wealth or that wanted education or that wanted to get ahead in the world, they spent such efforts to get their children to learn Greek that they never bothered with their children learning Hebrew. And for that reason, there were Jews in Paul's day that couldn't understand the Hebrew Scriptures. You'd have to read it to them in a Greek translation. Or in some cases, you'd read the Hebrew Scripture and then you'd have to give an Aramaic paraphrase, what we call the Targum. So if you ever see a footnote in the Bible that says the Targum says this, that's an Aramaic paraphrase of the original Hebrew. In any case, Paul says, that wasn't us. (laughs) I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. We spoke Hebrew, thank you very much. And what's more, he says, I was a Pharisee. Oh, you know, elsewhere, when he gives his testimony in the book of Acts, he describes the Pharisees as the strictest sect within within Judaism. They were a group of people that were distinct, a group of people that wanted to hold on to the Scriptures. They didn't want to lose their Hebrew. They didn't want to lose the Bible. They didn't want to embrace Greek philosophy and Greek science like the theory of evolution that the ancient Greeks had more than five centuries before the time of Christ. They didn't want those things. They wanted to be safe and hold on to the Bible. So what they did was they added all kinds of traditions. They said, you know, we're going to build a fence around the Bible. And as long as you keep the tradition, you won't build, you won't break the commandments. You know, fiddler on the roof. How do we keep our balance? Tradition. Okay? Now, I'm not going to sing or all, any of Tevye's songs from the musical, but that's true of many Jewish communities right around the world to this very day. That tradition is so very important to them. And the first time I ever got to go to Israel was 1993, going as a student to study in a school over there. And there were two students on either side of me on the airplane. They were both Orthodox Jews, one from Philadelphia, one from the great state of Washington, the city of Seattle. Don't think he had any Native American blood. He just looked like he was Orthodox Jewish. But anyway, there they were. And I got to talking to them. I said, oh, what are you guys doing? Well, uh, one of them was already accepted into Yale. And he was going to go to Yale, and he intended to go on and study to be a lawyer. But before he would go to Yale, and before he would go to law school, he was going to Jerusalem to spend a year in a yeshiva. That's like a Jewish seminary. He was going to spend a year in school, in other words, studying Talmud, the traditions of the rabbis. 
The other fellow who was from Seattle, he was accepted into the University of Pennsylvania, and I think he wanted to be a doctor. And very smart guys, these fellows sitting around me. I was like, man, how did I get put in this row? But there I was. And he was doing the same. He was already accepted into the University of Pennsylvania, not to be confused with Penn State. Penn State is a state school in north central PA. University of Pennsylvania is in Philadelphia. It's Ivy League. It's super hard to get into, let me tell you. So these were smart guys from wealthy families who already had planned out to get into high-powered careers where they were going to make a lot of money and do something in the world. But before they went to college, they were going to Jerusalem to spend a year studying the traditions of the fathers. Now we read in Galatians 1, that's how Paul was, right? He said, I exceeded many of my contemporaries in Jerusalem, or in Judaism rather, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. I was so into what we believed as Jews that I was passionate about it. I got the best grades. We find out elsewhere. He studied under the top teacher, Gamaliel, or Gamaliel, some, some pronounce it. I was, you know, in that elite. I was the rabbi of my generation. And I thought to do so much, he says later in the book of Acts, I thought to do so much against the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hated that name. Why did he hate that name? Well, because I thought it was a, a sect, you know, like a cult. These people were breaking off from the tradition of the fathers. And they were saying that Jesus was the Messiah and that you're not saved by keeping law, that you're saved by faith in the Lord Jesus. Now, this was a man who said that I, as touching the law, he says in Philippians 3, I was blameless. In other words, if you looked at his life, you couldn't say, Oh, Paul, you know, I saw you down to the gap the other night and you were eating a pork chop. <laughs> you broke Leviticus 11, didn't you? Now, you couldn't find him making any kind of mistake like that. Outwardly, he looked like he had it all together. Outwardly, he was like they used to describe Robert E. Lee at West Point. He was the marble man. You couldn't find a defect. You couldn't find any kind of chink in the armor, so to speak. But he knew he was a sinner. He would say later, I had not known uh, covetousness except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. See, that's the problem. He said, I went about seeking to establish my own righteousness. I tried to keep the law. I tried to work my way to God. And the more I tried, the more deep down something was pricking my conscience. You know, Paul, for all of your outward exterior, for all of your religious reputation, for all of how people think you're the high and mighty theologian and the rising rabbi, Paul, you know deep down there are sins in your life. Deep down you know, Paul, that when you stood there and you heard Stephen go through Torah, go through the Bible, go through the whole Tanakh, the whole Hebrew Bible, and talk about how God had revealed himself time and time again to the nation, and time and time again the nation had rejected the one whom God had sent. And Stephen said, you're doing it again. You've done it to Jesus Christ. Because he's Lord. He's the Son of God. And you've missed it. And as Stephen was willing to die, he didn't die cursing. He didn't die begging for mercy. He died saying, I behold the Son of Man standing in glory. He saw the Lord Jesus on the right hand of God. And Saul never forgot what happened that day. Never forgot how Stephen died. Oh, Acts 8.1 says that Saul was consenting unto his death. He was in hearty agreement with it. Later, when he would give his testimony in Acts, he would explain that when believers were put to death, I gave my vote against them. He would carry people off. He would have them beaten. He would have them whipped. He would have them imprisoned. And if they wouldn't recant and needed to be put to death, Paul said, yes, that is what ought to happen. But deep down, he couldn't get away from the fact that these people had something he didn't. 
that they went into death loving their enemies, forgiving those who persecuted them, and above all, clinging to the Lord Jesus Christ, whom they affirmed was not dead, but living. And the Holy Spirit was pricking his conscience, the goads of conviction. Till one day, not when he was wavering on his Judaism, not when he was beginning to doubt the traditions, not when anyone would have looked at him and said, oh, Paul, you're starting to relax, you're star- or Saul as he was then, you're starting to be half-hearted. No. He went to the chief priest and he said, you know, I'm getting kind of bored of persecuting these Christians here in Jerusalem and Judea. You think you could give me letters to go up to Damascus? I mean, remember when the Lord Jesus said uh, earlier in his ministry that where I go, you cannot come. And what did the Jewish enemies say? They said, well, where's he going to go? To the dispersion? Is he going to go to the Jews of the diaspora, those who are scattered abroad through different Gentile lands, different parts of the Roman Empire? And that's just where Saul wanted to go, to find every last Christian he could and stamp them out. So it was not a day where Saul was sort of half-hearted and beginning to change his mind and saying, well, what if there is some truth in this? There was no wavering. There was no apparent doubt. There was no vacillation on his part. He went down the highway to find Christians wherever he could and to do them what harm he could. And verse 3 of chapter 9, we read, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone about him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting? And the pronoun in the original is emphatic. Why are you persecuting me? I mean, that's a good question to ask any unbeliever who might be skeptical of the Lord Jesus Christ or who might be against the Lord Jesus and his gospel. What have you got against the Lord Jesus? Why would you be attacking the Lord Jesus? After all, it's a matter of history that the Lord Jesus was one of the greatest ethical and moral teachers that's ever walked on the face of the earth. I would contend he was the greatest. But even given an unbelieving perspective, uh, we'll, we'll at least say that it's easily proven that he's one of the great moralists who've ever lived on the face of the earth. I mean, even Gandhi, who was not a Christian, would walk around reading the New Testament because he admired so much the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially the Sermon on the Mount. Why are you persecuting the Lord Jesus? This is someone who received little children. This is someone who cared about the elderly. This is someone who touched the lepers and cleansed them. This is someone who raised the lame and opened the eyes of the blind and the deaf. The people that would have been on the sort of edges and fringes of society, suffering. And the Lord Jesus went about doing good to them. The Lord Jesus showed mercy to them. The Lord Jesus unfailingly showed by every word and every deed that God is love. Why would you persecute the Lord Jesus? And Saul asked the question, Who art thou, Lord? Because I'm sure now it was a long list of people that Saul had carried away to prison, a long list of people he had beaten, a long list of people he had compelled to blaspheme, and maybe a long list that he gave his vote that they should be killed. So which one would you be? (laughs) Well, if there's a light coming from heaven and a voice is coming from heaven, it's a safe assumption that it's the Lord speaking. But who is the Lord specifically? It's amazing, isn't it? that the next statement had to totally upend Saul's life. I am Jesus, he said, in verse number 5. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Not just you persecuted me in the past, you are persecuting me, you're doing this. Now you say, how did that happen? Saul, as far as we know, 
did not meet the Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry. Maybe he was one of those unnamed people that we read about in the Gospels, but there's no proof that he met him. We have no proof that Saul was in Jerusalem when the Lord Jesus was crucified. Saul was from Cilicia, over in modern-day Turkey. He was a citizen of Tarsus, a no-mean city, as he says, Later, And it was a university city, and he was a tremendously educated man. But also brought up in Jerusalem in the yeshiva there under Gamal, as we said earlier. In what sense, therefore, was he persecuting the Lord Jesus? Well, in this sense, and this is exceedingly precious, that what is done to you, my brother, what is done to you, my sister, our head in heaven feels keenly. That there's not any sorrow you bear, there's not any suffering that comes into your life, there's not any pain that assails you, that the risen Christ, to whom you are linked, your life is hidden with Christ in God, Colossians 3 says, if you're a believer. You're risen with Christ, and you're linked to Him, our union with the Lord. And what happens to you, the Lord knows about it. The Lord feels it. We can apply the words that he said about Israel to ourselves. He that toucheth you, toucheth the apple of my eye. It's like getting poked right in your pupil. That doesn't feel good, does it? The Lord felt it. There wasn't any believer, the most young, obscure, unimportant as the world goes believer that they persecuted. There wasn't anyone that the Lord didn't know what was going on. Because he said, they're going to do this to you for my name's sake. So the Lord knew it. He said, why are you persecuting me? And then to say to him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. In an instant he knew everything he thought he knew about the Lord Jesus Christ was wrong. He was Lord. And he was Christ. And Saul had been utterly wrong about him. But the wonderful thing is that as he's there prostrate on the ground, the next question is, what would you want me to do? And that really is the story of his life, that having discovered that the Lord Jesus is the Savior, having discovered that Jesus is God, having discovered that he is Lord in Christ, Paul thereafter committed himself to obey the Lord, to do whatever the Lord wanted him to do. It was an utter transformation. And it came about not because he saw the glory of the Lord, although he did, but when he opened his eyes again, he couldn't see anything. But he heard the word of the Lord. And we remember Romans 10 tells us, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that changed the biggest persecutor into, after the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest preacher. It changed one who was a mischievous, malevolent, enemy of the gospel to its greatest missionary and its greatest theologian undoubtedly and yet he was told to go into the city and to sit there for three days now three days often brings you to a new beginning in the bible I would just deduce as one example for sake of time the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ which happened on the third day the Lord Jesus has risen to an altogether different kind of existence not connected with this world which is passing away but a resurrection that's connected with the world to come the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness and he was going to have to wait for three days till a man Ananias came in and baptized him in the name of the Lord now Ananias didn't want to go when the Lord spoke with him uh, Ananias said excuse me Lord I've heard about this guy I mean this guy's like KGB he's like Gestapo you know he's come here to hunt Christians. And what does God say about him here? He says, verse 15, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles. Well, did he accomplish that? I tell you, Paul goes all about the Roman Empire, all through Gentile lands, preaching, until finally he preaches to Caesar. To kings, he says in verse 15. Yes, even to Caesar, he would bear witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the children of Israel. Wait a minute, them again? I thought they were the guys that put 
Saul up to persecuting the Christians. I thought they were the ones who rejected their Messiah. Oh, yes, says Paul, but I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why aren't you? Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first. And from Paul's day to ours, the Lord has been saving Jewish people because He loves them. Because He wants to show them mercy and grace and save them. The same way He loves Gentiles and wants to show us mercy and grace. And as I said before, He's going to fulfill every promise until the Lord Jesus reigns over that nation from Jerusalem. And all nations flow unto it. He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show Him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, there's that phrase again. We've already seen in Acts the importance of the name of the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus said in John 15, You'll suffer all these things for my name's sake. Well, who would have ever thought that the man who caused so many people to suffer for the name's sake of Jesus would himself suffer? And did he suffer? Oh, he suffered greatly. Read the book of Second Corinthians tonight. Then you'll read a digest of his sufferings in the cause of Christ. And eventually, he bore witness to the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, being the Son of God come in the flesh, being the Messiah and the Savior of the world, being the only Savior of sinners. He bore witness to that by even giving his life. He said, I have fought the fight. I have finished the course. I have have, uh, fought the good fight. I've run the race. I've finished my course. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me. And not to me only, but also to all those who love his appearing. Now, brothers and sisters, there are a lot of people tonight on our prayer list that we might well despair. We might think they're so hard. It's been so long. I've prayed for them for decades. And I don't see any change. Let me just say that God is still in the business of saving. That God is still long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. But the Lord said that this chosen vessel would have to suffer to bear witness for that name's sake. And brothers and sisters, we're going to have to suffer if we're going to witness for Christ too. Now, we'll suffer the ordinary things that everybody in a fallen world suffers. We will have aches and pains and diseases and sicknesses and problems. But because of the name of Christ, we'll suffer otherwise as well. We'll have people ridicule us. We'll have people speak against us. We'll have people criticize us. We may have people hit or abuse us if they can. And one day it may come that people may kill us. I don't know if that day will come to the Bahamas before the Lord comes. I'm not wishing for it. But that day already is here for many of our brothers and sisters around the world. And yet, as they are persecuted, as they suffer for the namesake of the Lord Jesus Christ, people are being brought to Christ, even some of the persecutors, even some of the hardest ones, because that's the kind of God we have. He saves sinners. Praise be his name. Father, we're thankful tonight for thy long suffering with Saul, because it shows us that anybody is on the table. Anyone can be saved. There's no one too bad. No one too far gone that thy grace can't reach them. And we just pray, Father, that we would pray in faith and not be weary and not faint. That we wouldn't stop witnessing. That we wouldn't stop living for the Lord. That we'd bear witness to the reality of the risen Christ in our lives. We pray it in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen.